Now, if you've got an invariant tensor, like HAP, this, uh, then if you use that invariant tensor to lower this index of the structure constants, then uh, the structure constant becomes completely extinct. Okay. Um, uh, I didn't tell you about patch, I didn't tell you about it last night. But, you know, you might think that this is a cool way of generating many, many invariant tensors. You see, because this object in any representation of the group forms an invariant tensor. But, you know, life is not that kind. Uh, it turns out that all of these are proportional to each other. Okay. So if you work these out in different representations, you can say the invariant tensor tends a different object. Okay, so uh, typically there is only one two index in the Okay, yes. Uh, so when for the index thing it was that uh, this being an invariant tensor equivalent to uh, among uh, one statement he says is that the group can be written as a sum of uh, commuting units. Commuting units? Uh, Direct sum of sum of commuting compact simple and u one sub Simple algebra is different from u one sub. What he is saying is that it's u ones plus compact algebra. Direct sum of so you could have u ones plus you could have these compact simple algebras. Let me read it out. He said, uh, the Lie algebra is direct sum of commuting compact simple, that's the first thing, and u1. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, no, SU2 is an example. That's what you want. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. No, uh, okay, good. So far, though, what we said works for any. any, any. The thing that, that is special for compact. Uh, for, com for compact 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 so whoops um, is that it's always possible to find the basis in, in which HAB is just delta IB when HAB is delta IB lowering and raising does nothing and so the fact that FABC is anti-symmetric when once you've lowered means that FABC uh, was anti-symmetric even before you lowered so that's the second statement in, uh, where is it he says somewhere that, yeah, point B here is that it's possible to find a basis such that the structure constants are anti-symmetric. It's always possible to find a basis such that they are anti-symmetric after you lower it. But for these special guys, it's possible to find it that that's such that it's anti-symmetric even before you lower it. Because that's the same thing as saying there's a basis in which the metric is there at And this invariant two. Okay. This is very form is there. Okay. Uh, so far, so good. Now, uh, now we started, then we went on to try to develop some physics. So, we talked about an action, that, uh, some field psi, uh, some field psi n, that, is, that was invariant under some non abelian uh, non abelian group transformation, such that psi was the psi. It was invariant under this when u was not a function of position. Okay. But uh, we want to try to make a, uh, make a theory which would have, which would promote the uh, gate invariance of the U1 theory to a non abelian gate invariance. So we want to try to make a theory in which the, this this psi goes to U x times psi with gate invariance. Okay, and we discovered that we could do that if we invented a covariant derivative, d mu which was d mu minus i d mu. Provided a mu transformed in the following way, a mu times to u a mu inverse uh, minus minus i uh, d mu u okay. Now there is a point here that I did not emphasize, but I, I should. Um, 
and uh, let, let me do that. Okay, you see this. Let us take this 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 transformation, which is a transformation for finite for finite uh, symmetry action, and uh, specialize it to an infinite transformation. Okay, so what? Uh, I mean, suppose u is equal to e to the power i epsilon of a epsilon of function x. Okay? So what is delta? What is delta in u? Delta in u is equal to i epsilon a ta commutator. Let me call yeah, epsilon a ta commutator. Uh, a. That's from this term. You can see that, right? You get something to the right, opposite side of the left. Wow. Okay. Uh, plus, let me call the both things. Epsilon A, B A. Okay. Uh, plus, uh, plus what? Plus, uh, uh, now you see we're doing working to infinitesimal order. So, um, at infinitesimal order, we can't keep the identity part in u. We need the epsilon part in u. Since we want only first order, the universe is just identity. Okay? So that's just plus i um, times, uh, that's a minus i times plus i, so that's no i. So plus delta u epsilon. Okay, so this epsilon, which is epsilon a times ta, okay, um, epsilon, which is epsilon a times ta, uh, it uses the following transformation on on a. Now, what was what was a? This a here was a a ta, where ta's were the generators in that representation in which the matter feels lived. So you might have been worried that, uh, look, we need a new gauge field for every representation of matter that exists in matter. Because we needed this gauge matrix to transform like this, and these U's were built out of that, the representation in which the matter transforms. But notice, if we write A as A, A, T, A, okay, if we choose to, implement that A is equal to A T. Then this transformation law here in terms of A A's is simply that delta A A. So we just equate coefficients of uh, uh, T. Okay, so let's write it out. So this is delta of A A T A is equal to I and then there was this let's call it epsilon M <coughs> A N and then F M uh, I times F M N A C A. Okay. Plus B mu A T. Yeah. 
<laughs> there was a guy in my class when I was an undergraduate who had this trick. When he wanted to slow down a class, so a very complicated class, uh, equation to put up his answer, sir, the dimensions don't match. <laughs> <laughs> Multiplying by, 
that is guaranteed to transform correctly. Because each covariant derivative transforms correctly. This gives us a two derivative algebraic object that uh, is anti symmetric and uh, in the abelian case reduces to the usual field strength. So clearly it's a good candidate for the name field strength. Okay? And uh, uh, we deduce the formula for it. So this was equal to y times x union minus x minus x. So I'll multiply this by that. Is equal to x mu. And that was a mu. Uh, uh, what do I want? I wanted yeah. d mu a mu. I wanted to be the first term, so that's part like that is good. So d mu a mu minus d mu a mu. Uh, <coughs> and then i times minus i times minus i. Okay. Now, once again, you might think, wow, we've got a new field strength for every representation we can choose. But if we work out what this is in components, okay, once again, if we write f new new a, f is equal to f new new a dA, okay, you will easily see that the expression for this is the same no matter what it is you use. Basically it's d mu d mu a mu a minus d mu a mu a plus minus i f a b c a uh, a b <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's good. Okay. Okay. So it doesn't matter which representation you choose. It's, it's a geometric object. Depends on the application. Okay. Um, so then we decided to try to do some stuff doing some physics. So we tried to write down some sort of Lagrangian, first involving just the gauge case. And the Lagrangian we wrote down is the so-called Gaynor's Lagrangian. Okay? So after some number, which we'll come to in a moment, uh, we had a trace of x mu nu, f mu nu, in any room. Now, this we could write as trace of f mu nu a text f mu nu b text c a b. And as we uh, reviewed a few minutes ago, uh, this trace here of t a p p is an invariant tensor. Okay? It's this a chain. And now we come to the important point. So this will is up to some number proportional to h the basically the unique in there. And now we come to an important point. The important point was that look, as we discussed for compact semi-simple regroups, it was possible to make h uh, choose a basis such that h a b was one. <coughs> More generally, h a b compact semi-simple regroups is a positive definite quadratic form. Okay? But for these non-compact groups, that's never true. SU 2 comma 1, ISO 3 comma 1. Lorenz group is an example. Familiar with that. Okay, where this HAB is like the metric space. Okay, uh, but the minus one. And what? Now, if we try to build a quantum theory based on this, we have the same problems that we had for 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 that particular those particular A's for which the, this H A B was minus one. We would have the same problems that we had when we tried to quantize the scalar field with the wrong side kinetic term. Then we would get unbounded this energy, we would get problems with unitarity. Okay? And we uh, don't as yet know how to make sense of such theories. So these theories by themselves, unless you accompany them by, you add to them some other principle which cuts out some of their states or something like that. It sometimes works. But, uh, uh, by themselves, you know, just just as theories by themselves, they do not. We don't know how to make sense of them. So we will not consider them by and large in this course. Yeah. So we will study basically theories in which this H A B is positive definite. Just the same thing as studying these positive set, uh, compact semi-simple theories. Okay. By the way, uh, 
Um, uh, by the way, um, there is a classification of all such groups. Okay? Or there's a com classification of all compact and simple uh, reactors. Okay? Uh, you know, of course, you can make a compact reactor by adding two. So we're interested in classification, irreducible classifications, you know, things that you can add to build, to build more. And uh, it's a very simple classification. Uh, so, uh, the simple classification basically says that there are three what people sometimes call classical groups. UN, I see when, the space of uh, unitary and cross end matrices with the trace, trace zero, or determinant one, fine. Okay, there's SON, there's SPN. These are the obvious examples. I mean, anyone fooling around with matrices will discover these examples. Okay. In addition to these obvious examples, there are a few exceptional guys that are not parameterized by number like any. You know, UN is an infinite series of such, sequence of such. Um, SUN is an infinite sequence of such groups. UN is not a parameterized UN, that's SUN. SUN, I should have been saying SUN, yes. SUN is, 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 is an example, uh, it comes with SU2, SU3, SU4, all the way up to infinity. Same for SON, same for SPA. Okay? But uh, these exceptional guys are really discrete exceptions. Uh, the biggest of these exceptional guys um, is a, a group that plays a big role in string theory. It's called E8. And uh, it's, a, it's sort of a big group, but it's not that big, you know, it's one that you can get to know and love. Uh, unlike actually the classification of uh, uh, discrete groups. Have you ever seen the classification of discrete groups? There's this thing called the monster group. It's really big. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody gets to know and love the monster group. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, the space of all possible Lie algebras that are relevant for building in the simplest context. Uh, um, gauge theories he is a very civilized space that's listed um, uh, that's listed in a you know in a, in a page so a, 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 anyone who wants to learn more about Lie algebras in a physics context I recommend this book by our George I called Lie algebras in particular physics it has a lot of very nice stuff and he will in particular take you through the, the classification of these algebras <coughs> okay great so in order to specify one of these non abelian gauge theories, you need to specify uh, the group. But the, this is a classified space. Okay? And uh, uh, fine. So this, this, this was the action. But the last thing that we did, that we, we studied in the last class, was that uh, we studied what the Hilbert space interpretation of, um, what we studied for the Hilbert space interpretation of this, uh, of the path integral based on such an action. And if you remember, what we found was it was very much like the U1 theory. Um, uh, we found that the Hilbert space was obtained by, by quantizing the uh, spatial oscillators A1, A2, A3 in four dimensions, subject to constraint. And the constraint was that all wave functions had to be invariant under gauge transformation law. And the gauge transformation law was simply uh, that the gauge transformation law for was simply this this That uh, uh, or the finite version of this. Okay, that any wave functional is a function of A's have to be invariant under finite equations of this The generator, if you remember, multiplied exactly like this. This, by the way, is the covariant derivative. So I think it's the covariant derivative of this huh. Okay. Um, fine. Any questions or comments about that before we move on to it? Okay. So now, um, the next thing we're going to do is just study this, the, the path integral that defines an automated case theory in a little more detail. You see, we had a formal brush at trying to understand this path integral. Um, and that formal brush was breaking up, as we just discussed, the path integral into path integral over AI is the path integral over A0, giving a Hilbert space interpretation of the path integral over AI, and then a projector interpretation of the path integral of A's. But there was one issue there. 
<coughs> and this projector interpretation, uh, which um, let me let me bring up as an analogy. You know, suppose we've got. Um, uh, uh, suppose we've got uh, a theory that lives in a circle. In some, well, suppose we've got a function that lives in a circle. Okay. And um, uh, I want to project only to those functions that are constant in the circle. Okay. One, way of, one crude way of doing it is to say, well, the projection that does it is the intake, because you're picking out the zero moment, the zero for you. Okay? So this is roughly the projection. But as you know, if I really wanted to make this projection, I should actually divide this projection by one. Because it's a, if it's a projector, then when acting on a constant, it should give back the constant. Ah, R is the radius of incident. The volume of the space. Okay? It's so only when you do this integral, normalized the norm to include in the denominator the volume of the space over which you do that you, you generate a projector. Now, if you remember our discussion that gave you a projector, we were doing this integral dA0 exponential of i times. Uh, uh, pi times uh, pi a zero. This was a generator of gauge transformations generated by this interplex a zero. Okay. And we were claiming that this was a projector, and that's true up to a normalization. Okay, this. Summed over, you know, it, it takes your, your wave function, gauge transforms, it sums over all gauge transforms. But you're far from guaranteed that if you do this in any case in this way, you will have generated a true projector, that is, that you have generated the normalization. Okay? Now, what are we integrating over? We're integrating over all gauge transformations, all space dependent gauge transformations. But if you remember, in our interpretation with the path integral, we got one such integral at each point, each slice of time. Now, if the normalization was that of a projector, it didn't matter because p squared was p. And this thing commuted through the hand. But if our normalization is not right, then we get extra normalization factors at each point in space. So, what, what is our extra normalization? Our extra normalization is essentially, as you might believe, the volume of gauge transformation. That depend on space and time. Space and then one for each space and time. So the volume of space time dependent gauge transformations. So you might think that the correct path integral, the path integral that we want to compute, that will have a, uh, that will have a good Hilbert space interpretation, is d a b o times d psi. Doesn't matter if it's good. Moment, divided by integral d omega, where omega is the space of all gauge transformations, depending on space of time. the volume of gauge. Now, there is another point of view. There is another point of view that also suggests that this is the case. Because, as all of you know, by construction, our action, Engel's action here was invariant under a mu goes to u a mu universe and i a mu u universe. For an arbitrary group element u, space time dependent time, group element. So, this path integral by itself, if you try to evaluate it in any naive way, it's just going to give you infinity. Why is it going to give you infinity? It's going to give you infinity because um, given any gauge configuration here, there are an infinite number of other gauge configurations that have the same action. 
These are gauge, config gauge configurations related to AMU by gauge transformation. The integral over this gauge transformation is going to give you a factor of the volume of the gauge group. Okay? So, dividing by this volume of the gauge group is precisely removing that integral over the gauge transformations so that you will get some finite answer. Okay? So, formally speaking, as you know, so roughly speaking, actually precisely speaking, what, 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 we, what we want to compute really is the path integral, which is the integral over AMU, divided by the integral over the volume of the, yeah, all gauge transformations. Yeah, please. Okay, what, what, what? Yeah, yes. You see, but, um, but you see, um, it's true, you could cancel, and that's what you would, if you mean lattice gauge theory, you wouldn't worry about this. Okay? But, um, you know the fact that there is a zero mode direction shows up at every order, including quadratic. What this means is that the quadratic part of your gauge theory action is not inverted. Okay? Which means that if you just try to do perturbation theory, for instance, without dealing with this issue, it would be ill-defined, have all kinds of problems. So to make sense of analytic computations in this in this theory, it's actually necessary to get rid of this, this zero. Okay? Okay? So what we're going to now do is a trick that will get rid of this. Called the funny pop of trick, and it's a very simple thing, but it took a surprisingly long time for people to understand. You know, roughly what to do was first understood by Feynman, just from consideration of unitarity. Just make things unitary, he roughly understood what should be done. And then the, the simple logic behind it took some time. Uh, so, so yeah. Is this somewhat similar to what we do, like when we divide by the vacuum bubble diagrams and we do like S matrix? No, this is more serious. You see, uh, that as um, uh, that as was asked, you know, we, we don't have to worry about it because we can just do the calculation without doing some division and then divide by zero insertions. Okay? But if we didn't do this in the first place, we wouldn't be able to do any calculation. The reason is that um, these zero modes uh, you see, uh, so we wouldn't be able to do any perturbation. Why is that? Let's 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 understand what perturbation theory is in terms of a path integral. See, in a path integral, um, a path integral. So let's take one minute, uh, one minute deviation to understand the nature of perturbation. Okay. So suppose you've got a path integral with some parameter like h bar. Okay. That's an action. Okay, now the rough idea is the one. Suppose I want to compute some path integral, let's say for going from time point A to point B in some time. Now, there is a classical trajectory that has the property that small deviations from this classical trajectory do not change the action. Every other trajectory almost cancels out if this h bar is very small because of very rapid associations. Steepest descent over its stationary phase about. Okay. So perturbation theory is, is the attempt to make that systematic. Okay, is to start with assuming you're on the classical trajectory, which in very simple cases just zero. Okay, and look at small fluctuations around the trajectory systematically. Okay, now if you've got an exact zero mode in this problem, okay, some exact zero mode, of course those modes are not suppressed. There are no fluctuations. So perturbation theory is going to break down. As we discussed, if you regulate this issue, it's not a serious issue. It's not an issue of principle, but it's an issue of practic practicality. Okay? So practically, so you think this is much more important. This then you can Okay, uh, other questions, comments? Okay, so now we're, we're going to try to look at a trick that helps us deal with this thing practically. Okay, so the trick is the following. Look, let's draw a picture first. What we've got, is these given any gauge field AMU, there are all the other gauge fields that are related to it by gauge transformations. Let's call all these gauge, other gauge fields gauge orbits of that gauge field. 
Okay. So, what we see is that physical states are states that are independent of where you are on the gauge object. The wave functions don't care. They're not functions of positions on that gauge object. It's only functions of which orbit you're on. Okay? Which is the physically states are characterized by which gauge orbit you're on. And not aware of the gauge orbit. That is the reason, that's the underlying reason why we have to divide by these gauge orbits. By the volume of these gauge orbits. They parameterize unphysically. Okay? So, imagine we've got these set of gauge orbits. What we want to do is to do a path integral really only over individual gauge orbits. Okay? Now, one way of doing that practically is to draw a line, some line, that goes through this place of gauge orbits and cuts each orbit exactly. If you manage to draw such a line, then what we need to do is only do a do the integral over all these configurations on this line. Okay? But you must do it with the right weightage. With the right weightage of each, each point in line. Because as you see, different gauge orbits could amount to different volumes and field space. As you see, visually. An analogy. Suppose you were interested, you had a function in two dimensional space that is a function only of radius. You want to do the integral over the whole space divided by 2 pi, which is the volume of rotations. Okay? One way of doing it is to say, well, let me just do the integral of the function only over x. But if you did integral f of x divided by 2 pi, you'd be doing it totally wrong. Or maybe not divided by 2 pi. You'd be doing it totally wrong. Because you've forgotten the major factor. The right way is, of course, as you know, r, dr, r f of x. Right? Let me say that. Let me say that. So useful that. Suppose I wanted to, I have functions only of r. This is the analog of gauge invariant. Gauge invariant action. Okay? The analog of the gauge group is the group of rotations. The volume of the gauge group in this case is 2 pi. It's a civilized one. Okay. And you want to do the, what you want to do is to evaluate d to x f of r divided by integral p omega. This, as we know, is integral d to x divided by 2 pi. Now, we know the right way to do this integral. We change from Cartesian to polar coordinates. Okay, then we can do the integral over, over theta. So 2 pi times r dr f r. This 2 pi divides this 2 pi cancels. The right answer is r dr f r. Now, you might crudely have thought, well, you might crudely have argued, well, let's look at this. My function is a function only of uh, r, so I have one slice, let me call it the x axis. So I'll integrate from 0 to infinity along the x, and the answer should just be dx f of x. But that's wrong, because we put on this r. Why have we put on the r? We've forgotten that different gauge orbits different rotation orbits and different sizes. As you rotate uh, you rotate over a particular gauge orbit, then you rotate over it. You're, you've, you've got a larger measure in physical measure space as you go to larger and larger. Okay? So you have to do things correctly. But if you do things correctly, you can get the right, somehow you get the right x factor, then you have to do it right. Just choose any. And he slice the cuts every gauge of once and do the integral. That's what we're aiming to do in a, in a, in a more complicated context. Is this clear? Um, so, this, uh, uh, this is actually very easily achieved by the following, by the following, uh, by the following device. 
Suppose you've invented some function whose zeros, whose set of zeros are this line. In this case, the function would be y. Okay, and then somehow you have to block out this Less zero, y is equal to zero and something like that. Okay? Suppose you invented some such function. Then one way of restricting you to just this line is to put a done delta function inside your path of text. But you don't want to change the path of text. Okay, so suppose you've invented some such function. This function is some, fun some function is usually chosen to be a local function. And we need this function to be one for each point in space, uh, space time, because the amount of gauge invariance we want to fix. The amount of gauge invariance we want to fix is one adjoint value field for each point in space time. Because epsilon A of x parameterizes your gauge invariance. So if you want to you want to fix that gauge transformation ambiguity. You need as many conditions as there are meet. Okay. So suppose you've got such, some such, some such, uh, some such uh, uh, function. Let me discuss examples of it. Okay. Uh, one example to keep in mind is what's called Lorenz. D mu a mu. This an example of such. Okay. Given this f of a, what you do is the following. Do an integral over the gauge root. Okay. With a delta function of f a x. Okay. Gauge transform. Okay. Now you see, because the, the zeros of this f of a define one such slice in gauge space, by definition, in this integral over the gauge orbits, this delta function will click only at one point in the gauge orbit. Otherwise, you're not going to put slice. Okay? So you're going to get this delta function clicking once and only once. Because it clicks, you only at zero. But this integral is not necessarily one. Because when you integrate a delta function, dx, delta of f of x, you don't get one. You get this is one over mod x prime of x. Okay? So this delta function is not necessarily one. And whatever stops it from being one, we will define to be delta of delta is called the body potential of matrix. Delta. Okay, so let's talk. So let us define this body of determinant by the identity by requiring the following thing. So this is the So the body of determinant, one over the body pop of determinant is this the body pop of determinant the determinant is this would in this example be mod f prime of x. Because this integral is 1 over Okay? Now, I'm going to say something that's utterly obvious, but I'll prove it in an algebraic way and it's sometimes be confused. Suppose we now ask, okay, uh, suppose we own this equation, this equation which you think of as a definition of the funding pop of determinant, which by the way, of course, depends on x. Uh, on the, in this equation, we make the following change of variables. We say let a be replaced by a twiddle h dot. Okay, let us make that change of variables. Okay, then inside my my, my definition that d omega delta of f a of a twiddle gauge transform. Okay, now we use difference. So this is gauge transform by gauge transformation. This denotes a gauge transformation. 
Thanks, Omega. Okay. Uh, delta F P of A twiddle gauge transformation. And there's further twiddle in this mini gauge transformation because there's an integration variable. Is equal to 1. But now, gauge transformations, you see, what, what are you doing here? First, here you're doing the gauge transformation by the twiddle gauge transformation. And then the gauge transformation by the gauge transformation of me. Okay? But that's the same thing as doing the uh, gauge transformation by u1 times u2. The gauge transformation is from the group point. It can be multiplied directly, like a group. Okay? And if you've chosen this integration measure to have the property, then it is both left and right invariant. That is, a change of variables, which is a change of variables by multiplying from the left or multiplying from the right by another group transformation, because this group is now a gate transformation, is an invariance of your measure. And this we will always claim is always possible and uh, always choose such a measure. Then you can just make a change of variables to the compound gauge transformation as your new gauge transformation. Okay? So then, having made that gauge, uh, that change of variables and changing the dummy index, it's not that. Sorry, uh, the original omega was uh, the gauge transformation acting on A, right? Not on the you see, the function is a function only of okay. uh, A. But it's a so widely a derivative function. If it is a derivative function, then... Uh... That's fine. But, but what I mean by gauge transformation of a function of A is act on the A with a gauge transformation. And then act on the A with another gauge transformation. There's no other notion of acting on the You know, only fields transform under gauge transformations, not functions. Okay, but we also see that it is 1 with delta p of omega a tilde 
omega. Therefore, okay, this is actually if you think about what this is saying geometrically, in terms of orbits, it's totally obvious. It's totally obvious. What it's telling you is that the Fatih Pop of determinant is the same at different points of the gauge group. That's clear because you see in the integral, you only click once. You only click when you hit that slice. It doesn't matter where you started from. So it's an utterly obvious statement, but this was just an algebraic proof of it. Right? Good. Now, with this formal notion of this party power determinant, whatever it is, okay, we're going to proceed to have an evaluation of the angles of the of the path. Let us proceed. So this is the quantity we wanted to evaluate. Now inside this quantity, let me insert d a nu d omega and then let me just insert one. This quantity was one, so I'll insert it. Integral d omega delta of f a a um, gauge charge form with respect to omega uh, then we can take this outside the integral, so that's delta f b a, and then e to the power minus a plus i s a divided by integral d. This is the path integral we want to compute. So all I've done is multiply the path integral I want to compute by one. Now, what I do is the following. Now I make a change of variables. Let a omega equals a. I assume that this change of variables is such that it's an invariance of the change. Okay, if you regulate the problem, you can easily show. That that uh, gauge transformations are uh, symmetric not just of the action but also of the measurement capacity. Okay, now if that's the case, then the measure is unchanged, so this becomes d uh, d a tilde a mu. Now this quantity here is integral d omega this is delta of f of a with a tilde because a tilde was a omega ok and then we get delta of a pop of of a tilde omega inverse and e to the power i s of a tilde omega inverse because the value pop of the determinant and the action of function of A, not A not tilde. And A tilde A is A tilde tends to be like that gauge shot now. But this was being too careful. Because we've seen that the value pop of determinant is gauge invariant. We can get rid of this. And we know that the action is gauge invariant. So we can get rid of this. We also have this integral, the division by integral of the omega. And now suddenly we see that nothing actually in the path integral depends on when expression tells that this new variable a tilde. Nothing in the path integral depends on omega. Okay? So we can just cancel this guy. Is this clear? And therefore the original path integral that we set out trying to compute, we have shown, is the same thing as integral d a delta f t of a and the power i s of a. Rewriting once again this dummy variable is renaming the dummy variable a from a. The dummy variable. Times delta of f of a. Okay. 
So what have we achieved? We have achieved what we set out to, set out to do. This delta function will ensure that we only integrate over the slices. And this Fadi Poop of determines whatever it is accounts for the volume of volume of field space contained in one gauge orbit that changes as a function. This is the analog of the R and R B R. Not too damage. Okay? Now you might think this is pretty formal. This is a pretty formal thing. Because oh, it looks pretty well, it looks pretty formal. But it is not so. You see, the only thing that's formal about this object is this delta. Okay. This is useless unless we can write an expression for delta p, preferably one we can deal with. Okay? But there is a beautiful expression for this delta. Now, let us suppose that. Under, okay. Let us imagine that we have chosen our gauge. Okay? So that uh, delta Fp, uh, so, that, so that our Fa of A is Z. Okay? Now let's make small infinitesimal gauge transformations around that. Okay? Suppose the variation of delta Fe, because of an infinitesimal gauge transformation uh, labeled by epsilon b, is uh, delta Fe equal to, let's say, some, uh, and this is uh, A, A of x comma y, a P of x comma y epsilon P of y in terms of y. The first order in epsilon, you know what else can it be? Has to take this form. Okay? Yeah, although we don't need it for what I'm saying, in all practical applications of this, we would choose a gate fixing condition so that this A is a local function. So it will depend only on local data. That may be derivatives, but otherwise. Okay. Then, what is the expression? What is the expression for this Fadi Pop of the term? This is just the generalization of the 1 over mod f prime that we discussed. It's simply 1 over, so the Fadi Pop of the term. It's simply the determinant of this operator. Thought of as an operator acting on the space of adjoint value functions. Right? This is the small this thing is sometimes written as this AAB may, may be thought of as a functional derivative of F A with respect of X with respect to epsilon B of Y. By definition of functional derivative, to the first order change, epsilon, this is functional derivative. And the delta function for what determines, simply the measure factor for the, for the delta function okay, is 1 over the determinant of this object. Remember, it's a determinant both in AB space as well as in XY space. It's an operator acting on the space of functions. Capital A is the unit. No, no, the capital is not it. Capital A is whatever it is. Capital A, it's this. Sorry. Capital A, gauge field, in fact, has only one atom. This is an object, there's two atoms. Okay? So, are we happy? This body for pop determinant is, is this object. Now, okay, so you've got an expression as a determinant. Sorry, I call it the second, the second uh, determinant. Why does a determinant come yeah, up? It's because of the following formula of, of delta function. Suppose you've got a multivariable delta function. 
to a delta of, let's suppose f m, okay, product of okay, delta of f m of x. That's a f m of, ah, uh, let's some, some number of variables, let's call them y, g. Okay? And you want to do the integral pi of b, y, g. The product of the gradient change. The as many fm's as y j's, because otherwise you don't have the delta function that's not saturated. Okay? Then the uh, formula for this this uh, this this this, this uh, delta function is the generalization of one over f prime. So is, but this is equal to one over the Jacobian. From Jacobian from y square. Exactly, exactly. So one over the Jacobian that gives you del fm by del y g. One over this, this determinant. This is a formula you can easily derive by as one gets there, changing the Okay? I've done exactly the same thing here. Except that it's an infinite dimension space. It's this functional determinant. Okay? Uh, we have to actually go ahead. Our postdocs are leaving. But, uh, uh, but, 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 uh, this formula by itself would not yet be too useful. However, it actually becomes useful when married with something else we studied two lectures ago. Namely, a very interesting formula for cross money. So, this is a formula I'm going to ask you to prove. Okay. Prove the following. Prove that if you've got. Uh, B, B, I, B, C, J, product over I, product over J, e to the power B, I, M, I, J, C, J. Okay? Then this up to some plus minus sign that you will get straight is equal to determined. Provided B's and C's are cross money. Otherwise, it would be doubts. <laughs> exactly. The same formula would be true of bosons, but with a determinant being doubts. And if you put it away, there's some signs. Okay, yeah, let's put the sign in the box. Okay. Um, same formula would be true for bosons with doubts. So, Grassmannian quadratic integrals are as simple as bosonic quadratic integrals. You get determinants only up rather than down. Now, what we want for the Fadi Popov determinant is a determinant upstairs. Okay. And so, this, the formula for this determinant can be rewritten as exponential of. Sorry. Should I? Ah, I'll be disturbed. Ah, we have to go down, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm coming in one. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm just. Kidding. The determinant of B A of X. Uh, if BA of X, then this B, okay, delta F A by delta epsilon B X Y C D of Y. Path integral D B B C. representation for this determinant. So now, instead of writing this path of determinant, we replace it by a path integral where the path integral runs over the gauge fields, as well as two new auxiliary adjoint valued adjoint valued anti-commuting fields, B and C. And now, this is now a perfectly standard path integral. You can use the delta function, sometimes you can just do the delta function. Exponentiated. Okay? And do the path integral. So then you're stuck to the slice because of the delta. And then you do the path integral over A's as well as these B's and C's. These B's and C's are called costs. Okay, now we better stop now. But uh, uh, we continue on Monday. Okay.
बंद हो गया बंद हो गई है